first step in the evolution of JavaScript as uh, is sort of something that can do more complex computations. And hopefully uh, we'll get into some more detail of the inner workings and get into some coding examples at the end. So a more pragmatic question to start off with, rather than go, jumping in at a, right into what is WebAssembly, is, is why WebAssembly? Uh, so there's been a continuing demand for web apps to do more and more. Uh, unfortunately, we're long past the days, well fortunately, we're long past the days of the internet just being documents. JavaScript has taken us a long way towards these large, uh, full-functioning web apps that we've come to depend on. But we're starting to reach the limits of what JavaScript can do compared to what we would like to see done on the web. The kind of the nature of JavaScript prevents us from doing more complex computation um, and prevents us from doing things like video editing and more advanced gaming and things like that on the web. Another reason is people hate plugins. Uh, previously, when we needed something, uh, when we needed something to happen on the web that gave us access to something on your PC or gave us more native runtimes, so we installed a plugin. And I, I don't, and I'm sure nobody else misses the days when we had to install or update Flash just to see some new web content almost every week, it seems like. Finally, JavaScript is, is a high level and loosely typed language, which we'll see is, is, a, is a blessing and a curse, it's, it's a curse as well. Um, and WebAssembly is sort of the panacea for uh, the curse aspect of this. So what do we mean when we talk about JavaScript being high level? So it, it, it's very abstract and it keeps us away from the machine internals uh, that probably we don't want to know about which is great because it allow, allows for more expressive code and allows us to write things that are really semantic and easy to understand. And then loosely typed means that we don't have to explicitly uh, define what's gonna go into a memory space at the time that we ask for it. So I would like to uh, use this simple function to illustrate why some of those blessings can also cause some problems. So here we just have a function that takes in two parameters and adds them, because it gives the return value of it. Uh, but I think few people know what happens exactly uh, every time that the JavaScript interpreter sees the plus sign. So here's the ECMAScript runtime semantics for the, both the plus and the multiplication sign. And you can see it's a long list of, of uh, actions that need to be taken. You get the value of the left, get the value of the right, send them both to primitive. Uh, because of the high level loosely typed nature of JavaScript, there are a lot of type coercions and lookups that we have to do. Uh, the engine has to know, are we adding a float to a string or an object to an integer? So if we break this down and put it in a diagram as to what happens every time JavaScript sees the plus sign, it looks like this. And it's pretty terrifying. So I have to give credit to Alex Danilo, who gave a recent talk for Wasm at Google. I uh, borrowed this slide from him. I was going to recreate it myself, but then I didn't because you can look at it and see why. So the problem here is there's no way to explicitly tell JavaScript that I'm not using a string. And I, or I'm not using a number, or I want to do exactly this or that. Uh, but what if there was? What if we could boil all this type checking and coercion down into a single opcode that we can give to our processor? Well, that's WebAssembly. So what is it? Um, it is a low-level assembly-like code able to run in modern browser. I know assembly sounds awful, but uh, you're not actually, actually writing in the assembly because it's just a compile target for languages such as C, C++, and Rust. There's support for more to come. And through a, through a tool chain that includes something like Inscripten and Binary, and you can compile it into something usable by JS. So it has a super compact binary form, which is a .wasm file. And when I say compact, I mean you can have a simple library in bytes, not kilobytes. Uh, it runs with near native performance. All four of the major browsers in their current release have uh, WebAssembly running at about 85% of native speed. It does not replace JavaScript. It is a tool to be used by and with JavaScript. Uh, so it can interface with JavaScript and integrate with the web APIs. It can pass functions to JavaScript. It can receive functions from JavaScript. Um, it can interface with web APIs like WebGL. Uh, so why is this really exciting? It's exciting because think about all the legacy code there is in C that can now just be compiled and run into, in a web environment, uh, which previously they would have had to do a complete rewrite into JavaScript. Now they can keep all that C code and just write a little bit of JavaScript as the glue in between what they have and what they want to be on the web. So previously, security was a big concern, um, mostly because languages like C and C++ have a heap memory, uh, uh, the way that they keep memory is in a heap and then a pointer to the memory. And people were scared that if you ran C++ in a browser that people would be able to move the pointer into a place where it shouldn't be and access things on your computer that they shouldn't have access to. The WebAssembly team solved this by making each WebAssembly instance a JavaScript typed array as its memory. 
Uh, so it's, the pointer is an index, and it's very cheap to tell if that index goes out of bound of the, index of, uh, the indexes of the array that it's, a, it's an LDU will call. So finally, WebAssembly is, WebAssembly code has a one-to-one -one readable, uh, human readable text format, which is .wast in the works. So currently it's just a series of S expressions. They hope to make this a more, more manageable uh, style, sort of like JavaScript that we can look at. But it's nice that this has this one-to-one -one factor because we can take a compiled file, quickly switch it over to its text format, tweak a few things, add a print statement or a console log for debugging, move it back to its compiled state and run it again to sort of do some real-time uh, real tweaking of things. So let's take a look at, uh, let's take a look at WAST. So this is our same add to function, only in WAST, which is a, 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 an S expression. Um, so S expressions are a tree that uh, uh, everything is wrapped in parentheses. So if you notice the module here is completely wrapped in parentheses and it has a child, which is this function, which is wrapped in parentheses and it has its own children. Uh, so each thing wrapped in parentheses is a node or a tree itself. So this module, we're having, we have a function under the namespace add two. We're taking in two, 32-bit integers as parameters, and our result's gonna be a 32-bit integer. So WebAssembly acts as a stack machine, so the two git locals will throw the two i32s onto the stack, i32.add will pull them off and do the opcode, and then we export under the add to name, namespace the function that we just created. So this is what it looks like in, in its binary form. So the two things to note here are the, the labels at the top for the binary magic number and the binary version. So there's been, uh, since this is still, it's just now becoming something that's no longer experimental. So the magic numbers have gone through many changes. It was a lot harder than I thought to get started doing this. The tool chain was pretty difficult to set up and a lot of the examples I found had out of date magic numbers. And eventually I found that I couldn't really use anything that wasn't posted within the last three months. So it, it was a little bit more difficult to get, start, get started than I thought it would be. But things are starting to level out now as support from all four of the major browsers have come out. And it's, it's, we're on the verge of actually seeing more and more of this on the web. So let's take a look at where this fits into the uh, JavaScript chain. So we have a, a diagram here of what JavaScript goes through to get turned into machine code. So we go from source code into a parser. Parser turns it into an abstract syntax tree, which, which is just an in-memory representation of your logic. That gets fed into a bytecode generator onto the interpreter or the compiler. Uh, JavaScript does its own garbage collection, which is something you have to do manually in, in WASM. Um, so let's take a look at where WebAssembly fits into this and what's, which of the processes it gets to actually skip in order to uh, further optimize itself. So if we kind of go down the chain, uh, we knock out all of these things, WebAssembly loads in right there. It's already optimized, so the compiler doesn't do anything with it. It just turns into machine code and then there we go. All right, got a little bit of time left. Oh, sorry for my dogs there. We're gonna do some examples. Um, let's do some examples here. Uh, so, I have some examples set up here. Uh, I have a small project here going where I have an index.html that I'm actually gonna be doing the coding in. I have an app.js where I'm just serving up a simple server uh, because the API that we have to use is fetch to uh, the, the JavaScript native fetch API. And we're gonna be using those to interact with these two simple WASM files that we have here. We have our add, add to that we've seen throughout the whole talk. And then we also have an in and out. If we have time, we'll get to both of them. Um, okay, so here I have the um, express, ex, I'm using express to statically serve up these. I have some examples of what the S, S expressions actually look like. And then I have my index HTML. Let's close this out. So we're gonna be working with this right here. So remember, this is actually in the binary, uh, binary version in the file. So if we go to index here, we can uh, open up a script tag. All right, so inside, we're gonna do fetch, and we're gonna fetch our add to dot wasm. And, um, oops. And what that gives us is a raw, di a raw binary data buffer. We're gonna dot then off of that and we're gonna take that, we'll just call it the response. And then with that response, we're gonna put that raw binary data buffer into an array buffer. And then from that, we're gonna take that and we're gonna take the bytes that it gives us. And we're gonna call WebAssembly, which is uh, on the window object in the 
browser. We're going to instantiate those bytes. Um, and what that's going to do is give us our instance. Uh, now, instantiate, it takes the binary code in the form of the array buffer. It compiles and instantiates it in one step. And the second parameter, which we'll talk about later, is how we can uh, give that instance our import object. So from there, we're going to say dot then with those results. And we're going to, let's just console log the results to see what it gives us. Save that. Uh, make sure that our node server is running here. All right. Okay. So we see here in our console that we've logged out an object. If we open that object up, we have the instance of WebAssembly, and then we have the module of WebAssembly. So every instance keeps the module itself for debugging purposes. So if we open up this instance, we see it has an exports object. We further open it up, we see it has our add to function. It's pretty cool. And its name is zero. So actually, we can now use this function if in results, we say results dot exports dot add, uh, oops, sorry, results dot instance dot exports dot add two. And then we call it just like a normal JavaScript function. We can add five and 15. We save our code. We see 20. And we have effectively circumvented all of the type checking and coercion that JavaScript does when it sees the plus sign into a simple opcode that we can use. Now, um, I think I'm probably running a little bit short on time. Uh, yep, so instead of going into my second example, I'm gonna give you a, a more uh, real demonstration of, of why this is important. Um, because I would not recommend writing all these codes to circumvent the JavaScript plus sign because it's already fairly efficient for simple calculations. Uh, but let's take a look at what, uh, what the ramifications are for more complex computation. So I know you guys are all familiar with the game of life. Uh, we're gonna open up a game of life here. So this is Conway's game of life where every, uh, every block is five pixels wide. This is running in WebAssembly at, at the time. You can see up in the top right hand corner here, we have uh, the frames per second. And it's actually varying a little bit, I think, because we're, we're running, uh, running Zoom as well. But if we use a JavaScript engine, we get a little bit of a reduction. This is still pretty much on par with WebAssembly. The real test is when we turn it to a one pixel way of life, where every box is one pixel wide. You see already, even with WebAssembly, we're starting to get low frames per seconds. Now, if I wasn't running Zoom, this has been running out 30, uh, 30 to 40. But now if we actually switch it over to JavaScript, you'll notice that it's almost, uh, it's almost half. It, 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 in, in fact, every time I've done this test, I've, I've been able to get almost the same performance out of the five pixel and one pixel in Wasm and almost half of the performance in JavaScript. So you notice we're, we're getting below five and we're getting down to three to five frames per second here. We swap it over to use the Wasm engine, we get an instant double in our frames per second. Um, and this is where you can see, even with a simple game of life, you're seeing this much of a difference. So if you can imagine uh, trying to run a complex game on the web or something like that, this is gonna give you a, a real, real performance boost. Um, so that pretty much concludes what I would like to talk about. And if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to field them. There are a couple of things that I left out in the interest of time. So if you're interested in, interested in compiling C or C++ and learning how to use Inscription to do that, I'm more than happy to help you with that um, uh, off, off camera. You can just let me know. Then I'll take questions.